Sure do. Recording has started. Let me uh, have you go ahead and and uh, take it take it from here. Great. Thank you so much, Jeff. And thank, I'm really thrilled to be here and to give this talk about lower extremity ulcers. And it's going to be a fairly practical uh, presentation um, so that uh, the, you'll have some takeaways so that at the end of this, you can uh, feel more comfortable in the, uh, the diagnosis and management of these conditions. So really thr thrilled to, uh, to be here and also to be uh, part of this lectureship series. Uh, let me see. Could you advance it? Uh, oh, yeah. Because of some AV difficulties, uh, I'm going to uh, have uh, Jason uh, uh, advance it. Um, I, I have these uh, disclosures, but they really don't uh, won't impact. Uh, some of the work I'll show you re regarding debridement funded by the NIH. And while I'm a consultant for Smith & Nephew, it, it's probably not relevant uh, with regard to anything I'll say about products or things of that nature. Next. So um, I'm going to start with an algorithm of care, and then I'm going to work you through that algorithm. So I'm going to tell you what I'm going to tell you, and then I'll tell you it, and then I'll tell you what I told you. So uh, what, what generally we do is in dermatology in general, but especially when we t take care of lower extremity wounds. And when I say lower extremity wounds, I'm going to talk about both leg ulcers and foot ulcers. And I will, you'll see a, a divide. Uh, I'll start with leg ulcers and then move to foot ulcers and then combine of them as we move forward. So we start with a clinical examination forward. And, uh, and the three most common chronic wounds uh, that we see on the leg are the venous leg ulcer, the arterial ulcer, and the diabetic foot ulcer. So whenever we walk into the room, we say to ourselves, is this a common chronic wound or is it not a common chronic wound? Obviously, because the common chronic wounds are common, that, that's going to be the the majority, and we'll talk about how common they are in a little bit later. Next. Uh, then it's critical whenever you see someone with um, a leg or, or foot wound is to evaluate their arterial vascular supply. Next. And then once you decide that it's a common chronic wound, you've evaluated the vascular supply, then you go on to a trial of treatment. Next. Now, if you evaluate a patient, you do the clinical examination, and you see that the, uh, the wound looks funny. It's in an abnormal location. It, it looks funny or presenting funny, meaning that it has an abnormal appearance, or maybe there's excruciating pain, or some part of the presentation is atypical. Then what we do is next is to perform a biopsy to uh, assure or to help us diagnose what the uh, atypical uh, presentation is and what the cause of that ulcer is. Next. Then once we do a biopsy, sometimes the histologic findings on that biopsy will focus us in a specific direction, at which time we often carry out a laboratory evaluation. Next. Next. Now, Oftentimes, even if we uh, uh, go down the path of uh, doing a, uh, thinking it's a common chronic wound, doing an vascular evaluation, starting treatment, if the patient doesn't respond to that treatment, then we'll also rethink the situation and do a biopsy if the patient doesn't respond to the treatment. And typically, the treatments I'm going to talk about uh, as we get to the management part initially is the idea of using compression offloading wounds that are on the foot, debridement, making sure you actually measure the wound to assure that it's getting better, or if it's not getting better, either rethinking what's going on or moving on to adjunctive treatment. So this first slide summarizes the rest of my presentation. I'm going to go through each and every one of these parts so that you can feel comfortable in uh, evaluating and managing uh, these wounds. Next slide. So I'm going to start with leg ulcers and then move on to foot ulcers in a moment. Next. And next slide. And uh, by far, the most common leg ulcer is the venous leg ulcer. In fact, generally, I tell my residents, if you're in the ER at 3 o'clock in the morning and you see somebody with a leg ulcer, uh, probably uh, 60 to 80 percent of all leg ulcer do, are due to venous and what we normally see when we see venous leg ulcers is wounds that have somewhat a, uh, um, irregular shape, 
that it's uh, that the borders are somewhat sloping but relatively well defined. I often say that the borders are akin to a lake or an ocean. So you kind of wade into the wound as opposed to jumping into the wound, like the side of a pool that you may see with arterial ulcers that are more punched out. That the surrounding skin is abnormal. It's hard, it's red, and there may be dermatitis. And the wound itself, the wound bed also often has this fibrinous yellow exudate. The wounds are typically at the bottom of the leg around the ankle. And this is the, the malleolar region, often medial, but sometimes lateral malleolar. And this has also been called the gaiter area because British soldiers have boots and, the, and, and part of those boots, that's called the gaiter area and other shoe wear often has this gaiter. So it's around the ankle. Now, if I was given this lecture 25 years ago, I would tell you venous leg ulcers don't hurt. But the truth is, is that two thirds to three quarters of them do hurt but it's more of an aching or a dull pain as opposed to an intense pain. And that's awful important as you think about etiologies of the wound. Edema is very common. And because we're dealing with the older population, probably up to 10 to 20, 25% of these patients may have concomitant arterial disease, which will become important and critical to evaluate. Next slide. Next slide. Uh, is the next slide? Okay. So once again, venous leg ulcers, pictured here, is the most common form of leg ulcers encountered in clinical practice. Next. Um, and and what we found is that while many of these wounds heal. And whether you look at clinical trials or you look at uh, data sets of clinical experience, um, uh, if you treat these wounds and follow them for, over, for about six months, somewhere between 30 and 75% of these wounds heal in, in, in the data. That means though, however, 25 to 70% don't heal. And, uh, and that often, that refractory group often drives costs. Now, this is associated with uh, getting older, so as our population gets older, uh, we expect that the prevalence and cost of venous leg ulcers will increase you know, as in, in coming decades. Next slide. Now, uh, you may not think of it in, in these terms, but there are a number of risk factors for venous leg ulcers, advance, and you could subdivide them into those that uh, may be inherited, and, and you may not think of venous leg ulcers as an inherited disease, but if you have a family history, if you have a history of superficial or deep vein thrombosis, and sometimes that's a heritable uh, predisposition, you may have arthritis or skeletal or joint disease, which may be a heritable uh, condition. And if your parent has a history of uh, uh, ankle ulcers, uh, these are all risk factors, and these are non-modifiable or in some cases in inherited. Next. There are also modifiable risk factors. Uh, such as higher body mass index, uh, not all arthritis are inherited, a uh, number of pregnancies has been associated with development of venous leg ulcers, physical activity, and of course your own ulcer history uh, uh, is a risk factor for a subsequent venous leg ulcer. And then next, uh, having very, uh, just go back, having very severe fibrosis, uh, and we call this lipodermatosclerosis, oftentimes the lower limb looks like an inverted champagne bottle or an inverted bowling pin. And this is associated with uh, advanced disease, long-standing disease. And we'll, you'll see more about lipodermatosclerosis a little bit later. Next. Now, my, uh, my, uh, myself and my group has had an interest in, uh, obviously, wounds and leg ulcers for a long time. Here are some recent publications we've had, both in the dermatology literature, uh, the wound healing literature, uh, the internal medicine and general medicine uh, literature that will serve as uh, some background and, and reference, although hopefully most of my slides are referenced. Next. Now, um, it turns out that uh, while we had an uh, inkling of how common these venous leg ulcers were, next, it turns out that uh, they're even more common than we, uh, uh, than we even uh, thought. And uh, it's, it's about 2.2% of uh, patients 
uh, in the Medicare population over the age of 65 uh, have venous leg ulcers during a year, and, uh, and uh, uh, younger populations is a little bit less, and this was a study that looked at both Medicare and private insurance. Uh, but overall, uh, the prevalence of VLU in uh, each year is about 2.2 million Americans each year. Now, if you uh, take those 2.2 million patients that have venous leg ulcers and multiply it by the incremental cost, next slide, of having a venous leg ulcer, and then if you have matched comparison between patients who have venous leg ulcers and patients that don't, the incremental cost is about six to 7,000. So if you take that six to 7,000, next, and multiply it by 2.2 million uh, patients, next, you come up with the total incremental cost of caring for venous leg ulcers of about $15 billion annually. Now, for those patients who are young enough to still be working, um, you generally they take about 50% more time off from work for sick days to care for the venous leg ulcers. The average American takes about two weeks to uh, go to the doctor's office and to have medical care. A patient with venous leg ulcer takes about three weeks off each year for medical care. Next. Now, I told you some of these uh, features of the venous leg ulcers in the gator area or at the malleoli, the fa fact that it's an aching, uh, maybe a little bit of a burning pain and tightness. Uh, there's edema, there's lipodermatosclerosis, there may be uh, dermatitis um, and, uh, and uh, hemosiderin deposition. And the borders are shallow or sh sloping. And this is in contrast next to an arterial ulcer uh, which is the other common chronic ulcer on the uh, leg, where the ulcers tend to be uh, distal or anterior, and they're anterior because of there's less duplication of arterial blood vessels on the anterior aspect of the leg, or distal because there's narrowing of the vessels. And these tend to be more intensely painful, more sudden onset. The lack of hemosiderin, edema, lipodermatosclerosis, or uh, dermatitis, and these ulcers tend to be punched out. Now, as I mentioned previously, some people have a venous ulcer with concomitant or arterial disease, and that's why it's important to do our vascular studies in all patients with leg ulcers and limb ulcers. Next. So here's a picture, next, of an of a arterial ulcer where it's very little surrounding skin changes, punched out ulcers deep, and of course, if you look for pulses, you would absence or diminish pulses. And in cont contrast to a venous ulcer, next, uh, where it's sloping, shallow borders, a lot of surrounding skin changes, uh, and uh, more of a, a, a kind of a lake or a, a, or a ocean sloping borders as opposed to a punched out or a side of a pool uh, that looks like a, a arterial ulcer. Next. So, as I mentioned, whenever you see a leg ulcer, especially those leg ulcers of common wound presentations, I haven't talked about diabetic foot ulcers yet. I focused on leg ulcers, it's critical that you do a vascular evaluation because uh, while it's not uh, uh, in, uh, necessarily the only thing you have to do to assure good arterial supply, you certainly want our good arterial supply when you're dealing with lower extremity wounds if possible. So next. Um, and uh, one of the critical things about this is that if you identify patients with leg ulcers that have poor circulation in their legs, this puts them in a special bucket. Not only may they have difficulty healing their wound, they have an increased risk of amputation. Uh, if you have uh, arterial disease in the legs, you may have arterial disease in the coronary and carotid arteries, so they have an increased risk of heart attack and stroke. And as a consequence, they'll have an increased risk of death. So you measure uh, the arterial circulation in the limb with the idea next that you have the opportunity to improve circulation. You may alter some of the standard therapies you were going to uh, do, like compression therapy or debridement. And then, of course, as I mentioned just a moment ago, if you identify arterial disease in the leg, it's important that you both look for arterial disease elsewhere, and, uh, uh, and I'll show you in a minute, an ankle brachial index of 0.9 is an independent risk factor for a heart attack, so you want to check for uh, arterial and carotid disease, and you also may want to intervene in, with lipid-lowering agents, diabetes control, smoking cessation, uh, among others, 
to reduce the risk of arterial disease elsewhere. Next. So uh, some people say, well, I'll just do a physical exam. And while some things are uh, helpful in physical exam, this is some data from over 20 years ago in the uh, internal medicine literature, such as uh, abnormal pedal pulses and unilateral cool extremities. Next. There are some things that we think may be helpful, but turn out uh, on uh, more rigorous examination are not helpful to really detect peripheral vascular disease, such as capillary refill, uh, foot discoloration, skill atrophy, and hairless skin has not been validated as being um, uh, truly predictive of peripheral vascular disease. And that's why objective vascular studies are critical. Next. So, we often start with something simple, uh, the ankle brachial index, which is the systolic blood pressure uh, in the leg over the arm. Uh, it has a relatively high sensitivity and specificity. Um, and the worse or lower the ankle brachial index, the higher the risk of uh, vascular events. So normally the blood pressure if in a supine person should be uh, the same in the arm and the leg. So the ankle brachial index should be one. But as it goes from 1 to 0 0.9, 0 0.8, 0 0.7 and lower, you have more severe vascular disease and higher risk of other vascular events. Next. Unfortunately, it's an imperfect exam. And because of uh, glycosylation in diabetics and calcification in elderly, oftentimes you can get a false, false normal or falsely elevated ankle brachial index. And in these populations, you certainly need do other screening for peripheral vascular disease because the, P, the ABI may be incorrect in this population. Next. The most common other vascular disease that we do is we do something called the pulse volume recordings with waveforms, which is a non-invasive arterial studies that you check the, the blood flow in the thighs and the, uh, the, the legs and the ankles. And what usually you see next, is triphasic high amplitude um, uh, findings. But as you go from triphasic to biphasic to monophasic and from high amplitude to lower amplitude, this signifies worsening arterial disease and it may require invasive testing to identify exact location and, and perhaps uh, opportunities for intervention. Next. Uh, there's a fair bit of data about that when you find peripheral vascular disease, how common it is and, and what it means. Certainly it affects men and women equally, and it's relatively high, 12 to 14% of the population. Certainly as with age, it gets worse. Uh, oftentimes patients are uh, asymptomatic, but still have an increased risk of uh, mortality. Next. And uh, about 50% of patients with vas peripheral vascular disease uh, exhibit clinical or EKG findings of coronary artery disease increased risk of coronary and artery disease and uh, cerebral vascular disease. And once you identify critical limb ischemia, that is severe peripheral vascular disease, the annual mortality is very high, 25% annual mortality. So checking for vascular disease in patients with leg and foot ulcers is critical. Next. Now, oftentimes when I talked about this uh, vascular disease, I'm talking about large vessels. Uh, the ABI, the pulse volume recorded, measures these large vessels. And oftentimes people say, well, what about the smaller vessels in the skin? Well, uh, oftentimes wound centers will check for these. Um, uh, and But there are other testing that uh, is done if you're looking to see the, uh, the patency of small vessels. Next. And I'm not going to go into great detail just to say that oftentimes transcutaneous oxygen measurements are done or skin perfusion. Pressure is often done at, in vascular labs and specialized centers to look for small vessel or microcirculatory disease. But typically, uh, measuring macro circulation, uh, especially from an internal medicine perspective, is going to be most critical because of all the associations and the opportunities to intervene uh, are highest with when you discover mi macro circulatory problems. Next. Now, venous uh, studies. Uh, are, are done, but they're not as primary or not as critical as arterial disease. Oftentimes, venous disease can be detected by clinical exam. Um, and generally, uh, we, we're, when we, venous tests are done, 
we're looking for a deep vein thrombosis and the implications of having a deep vein thrombosis. Uh, and then uh, vascular surgeons or vascular interventionalists may do venous disease if they want to uh, do, correct the venous disease from, through non-invasive uh, venous intervention. Um, but oftentimes the clinical diagnosis can be made and venous ultrasound is part of a confirmatory as, of, as opposed to a diagnostic uh, process. The reason being is you may have arterial, uh, excuse me, you may have venous uh, uh, insufficiency, but that may not mean that the ulcer is due to a venous insufficiency. It may be seen, you could have vasculitis, for example, and still have venous insufficiency. So oftentimes, even though you do these testing, it's really the clinical exam and clinical evaluation and other evaluations that make the diagnosis of the cause of the wound as opposed to purely a venous study. Next. Now, I do want to mention foot ulcers next. And by far the most common cause of foot ulcers is diabetes. And diabetes causes foot ulcers because of neuropathy, ischemia, or the combination of neuropathy or ischemia, or what we call neuroischemic ulcers. Neuropath uh, neuropathic ulcers are often on the bottom of the foot, is surrounded by callus. There's off they're often due to repetitive trauma. The vascular studies will be relatively normal. And, but neuropathy testing will detect the loss of sensation. Next. Uh, ischemic ulcers tend to be more distal. Uh, there's eschar, vascular studies, including pulsars and other vascular studies are abnormal. And, uh, and oftentimes the ulcers are punched out. And third is the neuroschemic ulcers, which is really a combination next of uh, the features that may uh, be a combination of having ulcers uh, either on the plantar aspect of the foot, distally, or other aspects of the foot. You'll have abnormal vascular studies, uh, but you'll also have some of the features of neuropathy as well. Next. So in addition to assessing a foot ulcer, uh, assessing the vascular status in the same way I showed you before, it's critical to assess the, uh, for neuropathy. And usually we use a Seems Weinstein or 10 gram monofilament uh, 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 validated um, uh, assessment includes checking 10 points on the bottom of the foot. But a very simple assessment is to check whether or not patients can feel in the area around the site of the ulcer. And that's kind of a quick and dirty way to know whether they can, uh, uh, they're neuropathic or not. Sometimes patients will have a sensation but they can't localize the sensation. So you may be uh, uh, applying a, the 10 gram monofilament pressure to the bottom of the foot, and the pressure is where that filament bends, but they can't tell you where that, that they're feeling something. They'll, you'll be putting the monofilament on the bottom of the foot, but they may feel this sensation uh, on the lateral aspect of the foot. And this is also a sign of neuropathy. Next. So once you uh, do a clinical exa examination, you've done vascular studies and neuropathic testing, and you decide that you're dealing with a, a, a vascularized uh, common chronic wound, a venous leg ulcer, a diabetic ulcer, if you have poor vascular supply, then you're going to consult your uh, vascular interventionists, your vascular surgeons, or in some institutions, cardiologists who may do vascular intervention or interventional radiologists. But assuming you have a well-vascularized limb, you're going to move on to a trial of treatment. Next. And the first thing, uh, for certainly for venous leg ulcers, you're going to do is apply compression therapy. Next. So let me tell you a little bit about compression therapy and a little bit about the etiology of venous ulcers, because compression really addresses this etiology. So assuming you are normal or I'm normal, if we're standing, because of, uh, uh, of gravity and gravitational forces, the pressure uh, in our legs is higher. Uh, but when we begin to walk, we activate our calf muscle pump, forcing the blood in the legs to return to the heart. If we're normal, our, our veins are normal, our valves are normal, those valves close, and the pressure in the lower extremity goes down. And then we stop walking, and the, then the, the, the veins refill from the arterial side, and that's, that is called the venous refill time. In a normal limb, it takes up to 20 seconds. 
So that normal ha normally happens. However, if you have uh, ca uh, problems with your venous circulation, what may happen is that when you uh, uh, when you stand, the pressure is high, but when, when you begin to walk, um, the blood will go back to the heart, but if you have reflux, the, the, the blood and the venous circulation, the veins will not close, pro the valves will not close properly, the veins will be dilated, and the, uh, the blood will reflux, and the pressure doesn't go down to the same extent and returns much quicker. So over the course of the walk, rest, walk cycle, the average pressure in the limb is higher. It's not unlike arterial circulation, where normally a blood pressure is 120 over 80, you measure it, it's higher, 140 over 90, and your arterial circulation. The pressure doesn't go higher in patients with uh, uh, venous disease, but you have what we call sustained ambulatory venous pressures as de de depicted in this chart. Next. Next. And with dilated veins, varicosities, with abnormal veins or valve, either because of congenital problems or scarring or history of deep vein thrombosis, you get reflux. And this is the most common cause of venous insufficiency, this reflux or venous, uh, which gives you this so-called venous hypertension or sustained ambulatory venous pressure. Next. Now, with this sustained ambulatory venous pressure, what you get is uh, uh, dilation of the, uh, the veins, and the endothelial cells separate uh, in the lower limb, and things begin to leak out. Fluid leaks out, white blood cells leak out, red blood cells leak out, and this leakage of those uh, blood cells, the leakage of proteins, leak, uh, Lead to, lead to the clinical manifestations of venous disease. Next slide. So when red cells leak out, they, uh, you get iron deposition. Iron stimulates melanocytes to make uh, more pigment, and you get this despigmentation that is due to both hemocinerin and melanin. White cells leak out and are activated. It causes uh, dermatitis. Fluid leaks out uh, that uh, causes edema. And when those activated white cells start creating, leak out and, and release proteases, you get tissue destruction and ulceration. So there's a direct link between this venous hypertension, the reflux, and the macromolecules and cells leaking out and causing the clinical manifestations of venous leg ulcer. Next. Now, while we often focus on the veins and valves, which is clearly the most common cause of venous ulceration, next. There are other things that can lead to calf muscle pump failure, next. So in addition to the veins and valves, which we just talked about and the reflux you see, next, you can also get the same clinical manifestations if you have muscular problems or nerve disease, next. Or if you have ankle range of motion or uh, that leads to gait abnormalities. And just to show you this, I'll ask each one of you to put your hand on your calf and now tighten your calf, activate your calf muscle. Okay? Now do it without moving your ankle. Very quickly, you can see that it's really tough to activate that calf muscle and help the venous blood return to the heart if you don't move your ankle. So if you had a fixed ankle, if you have arthritis, or if you even have a painful venous leg ulcer sitting on your ankle, all of a sudden your calf muscle function is diminished and you can have some of the same findings as a patient with valve or venous disease. Next. And that's why there has been some data with regard to um, uh, exercise and improvement of venous leg ulcers, which I'm not gonna focus on today, but just show you that the calf muscle uh, uh, function is uh, help uh, is important in development and the treatment of venous disease. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about more about compression, but I do want to tell you this little paradigm just to nail it home. And this is the story of Saint Peregrine. This is a famous painting, and the story behind this painting is Saint Peregrine. Next, 
was a, was a very uh, uh, religious man, but uh, at the age of 60, he developed an infection in his leg, and he went to see the doctors and say, they said, you really have a bad in infection, and you need an amputation. Next. But he was religious, so he went and he prayed. And the next day, the doctor came to perform the amputation. At the, to at the time, infection they called cancer. And, uh, but when he came to form the uh, amputation, he found no sign of cancer. And, uh, and St. Peregrine lived to be 25 years, and he was eventually canonized. Um, and this is the, patient, the, the painting that depicted uh, this miracle that occurred. Now, I want to point out a certain part of this picture. And I want to see, you see there's angels everywhere. Uh, but I want to focus the angel by St. Peregrine's leg. Next slide. And if you take a close look at this uh, angel, you can see that the angel is using compression. So the angel's secret is compression. So as when you apply compression, you're really doing God's work for patients. Next slide. So what is compression? Well, compression helps the venous return of the blood. It does other things as well. And there's really two types of compression. There's elastic compression and inelastic compression. Now, elastic compression often squeezes the leg. So it squeezes the leg whether uh, the patient is sitting or the patient is walking. So it gives what's called resting and working compression. The problem is, is that if a patient is resting and has their leg elevated, and the leg is still being squoze by the elastic bandage, if you have mild, mild arterial disease, you can cut off the circulation when the, the leg is elevated because it doesn't have the additional gravitational uh, arterial force to help perfuse the leg. Um, the other type of compression is inelastic compression, and the unaboot is the classic inelastic compression. You put it on, it hardens, and it sits there. And only when the person walks does that calf muscle hit that hard surface and help return the blow, uh, blood to the heart. So it, while the patient's doing nothing, just sitting or laying, it doesn't apply compression. So it has low resting pressure. But when the patient is walking or working their calf muscle, it applies the compression. And it's safer for arterial disease because it doesn't squeeze the leg all the time, only when the patient uh, um, is using the leg. Unfortunately, when you put this unaboot on, if you have a swollen leg, oftentimes you'll lose compression very quickly, and I'll show you that in a moment. Next. So it has high working and resting uh, uh, pressures for elastic compression, just to review. Next. It's not for arterial disease. And some of the forms of uh, uh, elastic compression are pro four bandaging systems or coband bandaging systems. Next, and this is in contraindication, in contradistinction to the inelastic pressures. Next, which are the classic unaboot, uh, um, and these are also called short stretch bandages. Elastic bandages tend to be long stretch, meaning they they stretch more than fifty percent. Inelastic bandages don't stretch as much, and they stretch less than 50%. They're also called short stretch. Next. 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 So we often think of compression as compression stockings and compression bandages. In the United States, for active wounds, we often use bandages so the compression stockings don't get soiled. Uh, we have more control over applying the compression bandages. And I just described some of the differences between elastic or long stretch bandages and inelastic and short stretch bandages, both of which work, but you may use uh, inelastic or short stretch in people with mild arterial disease as opposed to the uh, elastic or long stretch. Next. As I mentioned, uh, one of the, the problems with inelastic or short stretch bandages is if you if you put it on a demonis leg, it'll, uh, the edema will go down, but then you lose the compression because the muscle will no longer hit uh, that hard surface that's uh, around the uh, around the leg, and and therefore it has to be changed more frequently than an inelastic bandage. Next, once you reduce the edema, then it lasts longer. So critical 
to uh, the first part of uh, treating lower extremity wounds with good arterial supply is compression. Next. The second is offloading. And this is to, to relieve the pressure from foot ulcers. And this is really meant for diabetic foot ulcers. Next. And, there, and the idea here is you really want to take the pressure that is right on the ulcer and through this device redistribute it that same pressure to a greater area and reduce the pressure that's directly on the open wound. And there are a lot of different devices that have been used, footwear and legwear, to redistribute the pressure. Next. One of the benefits uh, that you want to do is you want to fix the ankle because what happens is patients with diabetes who develop foot ulcers because of repetitive trauma often lose proprioception and they often slap their foot when they walk so they have higher peak pressures so if you have a device that lacks or fix the ankle you reduce that slapping and reduce the elevated uh, pressure on the foot when they walk next and the second thing that's very critical is you want to make sure that the patients also wear this device. Because we've shown, uh, uh, and others have shown, that when you give somebody a, a, a shoe or a removable walker next, they only wear it one-fourth of the time. So what happens is they, when they get home and they're safe at home, they take off the device and Overall, only one in four steps is taken with a patient wearing the device. Now, it turns out that these devices are heavy, they're not very, not, they're not very comfortable, and there are problems with the devices, but we're also dealing with an, uh, a non-compliant population. Most of the diabetic foot ulcers are in type 2 diabetics. Obviously, these patients are overweight. They, um, they don't exercise very much. They don't take care of themselves. And this is a complication of diabetes, so they don't manage their diabetes well. So you ask this non-compliant group of people to wear this challenging device, oftentimes they're not going to use it or they're going to take it off. Next. Next. So what we try to do is ensure compliance. And one way to do this is to use casting, where a patient cannot easily remove the device. Next. And this has a lot of features. Uh, it certainly ensures compliance, but it also reduces the peak pressure because of uh, fixes the ankle. Uh, it shortens the stride length. It slows the walking. It reduces activity, all of which have beneficial effect on the diabetic foot. But it also it allows ambulation, so patients can walk. You don't force them to stay off of it, but their walk is shorter, uh, slower. And, and they take less steps. Next. Now, putting on a contact cast is challenging. You know, most of us are in cast text. So what, what has been done next is to, tr is to take a removable walker like this and then uh, put it, uh, Coban next around it or put plaster around it to really lock in next uh, the patient and to take an a removable device and make it non-removable or more difficult to remove. And people have termed this an instant total contact cast. And when you do this, you actually improve healing rates. And studies that have done in Miami and other places next have shown that if you randomize patients to a removable walker versus an instant contact cast, you improve the healing rates when you lock in compliance with the instant total contact cast. Next. The third thing in caring for uh, chronic wounds is debridement, next. And oftentimes when we think of debridement, we think of getting rid of the debris in the wounds, removing the, the slough, re and, uh, re removing the abnormal cells, reducing bacteria and the inflammation that is consequence to that, next. But I do want to highlight that we also want to redo, remove the surrounding skin, not just the wound, but the skin around the wound. So you here see somebody with diabetes and a diabetic foot ulcer. You can see the ulcer is relatively small. But when we debride this next, we actually remove all the abnormal cells. And the reason why we do this in, uh, on the surrounding skin next 
is that the cells around the wound are abnormal. They're hyperproliferative and non-migratory, they're callous, and they don't respond normally to growth factors. And what we've demonstrated next is that they overexpress certain uh, non-healing uh, phenotype. They, they express CMYC and they have nuclear as opposed to cytoplasmic expression of something called beta-catenin. And this is, uh, leads to a non-healing phenotype. So what we try to do is to get around the skin that has these uh, abnormalities to get to healthy skin that you can, that then can go on to heal next. So the idea here is you don't just re debride the center of the wound, but you debride the surrounding skin. And sometimes the debridement can be quite extensive. But we tell patients we take one step back, meaning we make their wound bigger in an effort to take two steps forward and allow them to have cells that are capable of healing and not abnormal or phenotypically abnormal. Next. Then it is critical to do something very simple, and that's to measure the change in the wound size next. And what we do is we do simple measures. You can do a ruler, you can do fancy assessments with cameras, but that you want to demonstrate that the wound is getting smaller next. Because there's excellent data that if you're not getting better, then you have to go on to do other therapies. And again, for uh, standard care for venous leg ulcers, compression, for diabetic foot ulcers, offloading, next. And if you show the wound is responding, well, that's great, continue standard of care. But if a wound is not getting smaller over about a uh, four week period of time, next, you wanna go on, next, and uh, go move on to uh, adjunctive care. And there's excellent data that suggests if you're not hitting uh, a critical improvement, and for diabetic foot ulcers, it's pretty simple. You're looking for a 50% reduction in wound size over a four week period of time. If you're not hitting that, the likelihood of healing is very small and you should move on to other therapies. Next. Next. Now I'm not gonna go into great detail about all the other therapies, but there are cellular products that have been shown and approved uh, for both venous leg ulcers and uh, diabetic foot ulcers skin substitutes that have living cells, next. There are skin substitutes that don't have living cells, also with uh, randomized controlled trial data showing benefit, next. There are uh, placental products that have shown uh, benefit for both diabetic foot ulcers and venous leg ulcers, next. There are growth factors that have shown uh, uh, benefit uh, for both diabetic foot ulcers, venous leg ulcers, next. And then there are even oral agents that have been shown to be beneficial in randomized control trials. Again, all of these are combined with standard of care, next. Now I wanna circle back to this algorithm. Go forward, next. And what about the wounds that are unusual looking? We focused the majority of this presentation on those common chronic wounds, but what about those that have atypical location, appearance, or presentation? Next. And the need to go on to do a biopsy. Next. And in the last 10 minutes or so, I want to focus on these wounds. And again, this is a foot ulcer, but foot ulcers don't come out at you. So while this would be a, a, a wound that you would want to have a biopsy obtained for because it has this atypical appearance, and this is a squamous cell carcinoma. Next. Here's a wound on the thigh, not the leg, not the foot. And thigh ulcers are very uncommon. And this was a young person with a thigh ulcer. So not only is it a atypical physical location, but it's occurring in an atypical location that is a younger leg. And this turns out to be a, a, a patient who was ref, uh, came into our ER from Central America. And this young woman had a lymphoma as the cause of her wound. Next. The other situation, so here's two different pictures next. So you walk into the room and you see a patient say, okay, that one on the left looks like a venous leg ulcer. I see hemosiderin, I see fibrosis, it's clinically consistent with a venous leg ulcer. I'm gonna go down the original algorithmic path. But this person on the right is different, next. This person doesn't have hemosiderin and fibrosis, they have purpura and necrosis. So this is someone 
that I would say looks a typical, atypical appearance. I'm going to take a biopsy next, and this biopsy in this case showed vasculitis. Next. So again, which is a venous leg ulcer? Next. Here's someone with a leg ulcer. Next. Um, but there's more to it. You see necrosis in the wound. You see uh, uh, something going on in the bottom of the foot. You see resorbed digits. Next. So this is an atypical appearance. Next. Where you see resorbed digits, foot ulcers in addition to the leg ulcer. Uh, so we did biopsies and we did evaluation. Next. And this patient had uh, a, a wound secondary to. Next leprosy or Hansen's disease, um, uh, which causes neuropathy, but also can cause leg ulcers in addition. Here's another uh, uh, wound next that here you see it's a leg ulcer, but you see the leg, uh, the ulcer extending beyond the malleolus all the way to the edge of, to the, almost to the edge of the foot. The borders are rolled. So we, this had an atypical appearance. We obtained a biopsy next, and this turned out to be cutaneous lymphoma next. So when you see an atypical location, an atypical appearance or presentation, that leads you to do a biopsy next. Now, furthermore, if you uh, see a patient and they're not responding to standard therapy, meaning you think it's a venous leg ulcer, but they're not getting better with compression. Yes, you'd consider adjunctive therapy, but you'd also say, well, say to yourself, well, what else am I missing? And here's a patient who we thought had a venous leg ulcer. We put them in compression. They weren't getting better. So we performed a biopsy because they weren't getting better. And this patient turned out to have squamous cell carcinoma. Next. So how do you do a biopsy? So when we do a biopsy, we take part of the ulcer edge and part of the ulcer itself. Next. And typically, we send a piece of the ulcer for histology, next, and part of the uh, um, ulcer for tissue culture, because we want both pathologic diagnosis and we want to make sure we're not missing an unusual or atypical infection due to a, a deep fungus or due to a mycobacteria, next. So the histology goes to the pathology lab and the microbiology goes to the microbiology lab. And there's lots of different causes of uncommon wounds listed here next. And I'm just going to show you some pictures of some of them. Here's a, a wound. It doesn't look like a venous leg ulcer, a diabetic foot ulcer. We did a biopsy next. And sometimes infectious causes cause wounds. This is somebody with cutaneous diphtheria next. Uh, oftentimes, metabolic problems may cause wounds, and we did a, uh, this patient had an atypical uh, wound, an eschar. We did a biopsy next, and this patient had uh, renal insufficiency, and this was an ulcer secondary to uh, secondary hyperparathyroidism or calciphylaxis next. This person uh, had an unresponsive lesion on the, uh, on the toe, and it was somewhat black, and the one on the right was a large exophytic ulcer, both of which we took biopsies from and turned out next to be a melanoma on your left, next, and a carposi sarcoma on your right. So in addition to infectious causes, metabolic disorders, sometimes malignancies uh, can present as wounds, next. Sometimes genetic diseases may present as wounds. On the left is a child with epidermolysis bullosa, next, and on the right is someone with progeria, or Werner syndrome, where they have cellular senescence and they get Achilles uh, uh, ulcers, which is very typical of this progeric syndrome or Werner syndrome. Next. Sometimes uh, vascular uh, problems, such as uh, next, sickle cell disease. This is bilateral circumferential ulcers due to sickle cell disease. Next. And each one of these ulcers, you'd walk into the room, you'd ask yourself, is this a common chronic wound? Is this a venous leg ulcer? Is this a diabetic ulcer? ulcer? Is this an ulcer from arterial disease? When you d get the answer no, then you say, okay, I'm going to do a biopsy. And in this case, this patient had an inflammatory ulcer next, uh, pyoderma gangrenosum, which is an excess of inflammation associated with an immune deficiency, Bruton's 
And then finally, psychological ulcers, psychological disorders may cause ulcers. And this is someone who was made this ulcer themselves. This patient uh, had a scalpel and a scissors and would, uh, would, would, would cut themselves and create this wound. And this is due to uh, next, this is a factitial ulcer, often due to psychological, psychological uh, conditions or to, uh, or secondary gain. So each one of these ulcers, because of the different etiologies, leads to different uh, treatment uh, algorithms. Next. Uh, and then, again, this is a situation where you'd say, this is not an arterial disease, it's not a venous disease, it's not a diabetic foot ulcer, I'm going to take a biopsy next. And the biopsy in this case shows these, in this patient shows these features next. You see the top layer of the skin is dying, the keratinocytes are dying, you're about to form an ulcer, you get uh, this epidermal death. And if you look in the dermis, you see the blood vessels are packed with these fibrin thrombi, next. And this package of, uh, of this thrombi within vessels is something that we call vasculopathy, next. So after we do a biopsy, oftentimes, based on that histology, next, it'll lead us to a vas laboratory evaluation, next. So if we saw that histology I just showed you, we say, well, what can cause this histology that could give this clinical picture, next? So for the case of that histologic uh, um, a picture of this vasculopathy or thrombi within the vessels, we do a, a evaluation of the things that may cause that histologic picture. Next. And these are some of the causes, the cryoprecipitable diseases. Next. The things that may cause both arterial and small vessel thrombi, uh, the antiphospholipid antibody syndrome and hyperhomocystinemia. Next. And things that cause both deep vein and small vessel thrombosis, the thrombotic disorders. Next. Most commonly, Next, protein C, protein S, antithrombin 3, and factor V Leiden. Next. So if we see that histologic pattern and we get a diagnosis histologically of, of, of vasculopathy, we next, we, we then assess for that. We look for cryoprecipitable diseases. Next. We look for the antiphospholipid antibody syndrome and hypercoagulable states. Next. And then we, uh, and this is the type of laboratory evaluation next that we may carry out. If we don't find anything, then we look on for, for other coagulopathies that are less common next. In a similar fashion, we do exactly the same thing for vasculitis. We see an atypical ulcer, take a biopsy, see a, a histologic diagnosis of vasculitis next. And then we look, we ask two questions. Why do they have the vasculitis? And how should I treat it? Is it just the skin or is it internal organs? Next. So we look for etiologies of vasculitis, whether it's drug, whether it's connective tissue disease, malignancy, typically lymphoreticular malignancies, infections or other things. We evaluate for this next. And we also do an evaluation of other organ systems involvement, uh, such as uh, the kidneys, the GI tract, the CNS, the liver and the lungs. Next. And then all of this will lead to therapy, next. And in the case of vasculopathy, if you see those little thrombi and you come with an etiology, next, based on a laboratory evaluation, then you're going to look for treatment that in general lyses those thrombi or reduces the production of those thrombi. And here are some treatments that we often use for that microthrombi disease, next. 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 And in a similar fashion for vasculitis, depending on the etiology and the extent of disease, where is the skin or other organs next, uh, we define a treatment. Next. And I'm not going to go into uh, great details, uh, whether it's limited treatment or more widespread or involving other organs next including things like steroids and steroid sparing agents next. 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 So just to summarize what I've told you uh, is that you'll see a, a wound, you'll, you'll, you'll assess the clinical presentation. If it's one of the common chronic wound presentations next, 
you'll go on to do vascular evaluation, spe specifically and importantly, uh, arterial evaluation, and then you go on to treatment, either fix the vascular disease or go on to a trial of treatment. Next. If you find out that the presentation is atypical, then you'll go on to do a biopsy next and the laboratory evaluation based on the histologic findings. And then, uh, and if the trial of treatment fails, then you may consider going on to uh, re-biopsying and to make sure you didn't miss anything. And remember the standard of care for those common chronic wounds, compression for venous leg ulcers, offloading for diabetic foot ulcers, debridement, make sure you measure the wound size. And if it's not getting better, you may consider adjunctive treatment. So I apologize for some of the AV challenges that I, that I wasn't driving the presentation, but I'll stop here. I'll thank you very much for your attention and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, so uh, thank you, uh, Rob, uh, excellent uh, review. Um, let's see, in the uh, chat, I saw that somebody asked about a biopsy, but I think you answered that uh, question. Um, and uh, then someone uh, made a comment about uh, using uh, uh, prolia den denu uh, denusimab. You know about that for chronic venous stasis. So th there, there have been uh, uh, a number of flebotonic uh, 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 agents that have been that have been studied and uh, uh, used for either venous ulcers or venous insufficiency. Um, I, I, um, among them, uh, of those flebotonic agents, is uh, uh, the one that we use quite often is uh, uh, horse chestnut seed extract. Uh, that while it doesn't heal uh, venous ulcers faster, it does reduce uh, some of the symptoms, especially edema associated with venous insufficiency, uh, to the same extent actually that compression does. And I think uh, to, uh, some of these, there are a number of other agents that uh, work in a similar fashion. Okay, Courtney has asked uh, whether pulse volume recordings with waveforms are standard at most hospitals and whether they're easy to order, or is yes. that something that you perform in your office? No, so um, so we send them to the vascular lab to have uh, PVRs with uh, with uh, waveforms, and it's a standard procedure. It's kind of the the run of the mill uh, uh, vascular studies as a non invasive. Uh, uh, so it should be if you have Epic, it's you can order right off of Epic. And what about uh, do you add uh, toe indices to ABIs? Um, Typically, um, uh, I don't, uh, unless uh, the, the, the major reason we get uh, transcutaneous oxygen measurements uh, uh, is um, if I'm, we're going to do hyperbaric oxygen. If, if you are doing vascular studies in your own clinic and you have somebody with uh, either or old or diabetic, uh, the toe vessels, the foot vessels don't calcify and glycosylate like the leg vessels. So that's why a TBI would be, an, uh, which is a toe brachial index, you can, uh, you can do and is more accurate in elderly patients and diabetics. Uh, and that could be done within the context of the clinic. But if you're going to send them to the vascular lab, the, the pulse, pulse volume recording is, will, would suffice. Okay. And I don't uh, think I see any more uh, comments in the, anybody have any uh, comments or questions uh, for Dr. Kirstner uh, that wants to turn their uh, speakers on and ask a question? And in the, uh, in the chat, uh, Jason, like always, has uh, placed the, uh, the uh, CME number. So for those of you who want it, it's in the chat. Okay, I'm not hearing much. So, uh, so the tradition in the, uh, in the Department of Medicine, which this is, we're, we're a division of medicine, is that uh, is that our uh, visiting professors from outside of the University of Louisville get a, a gift um, that uh, will be sent to you. Uh, even if you had been here, uh, they would give you the gift. They let you hold it. Uh, they take a picture of you with it. Um, but uh, uh, the uh, and Jason is going to show that to you in a minute. Uh, but we have uh, something here called the Louisville Slugger Factory where they make uh, baseball bats, and so. Uh, what happens is you, you get to hold it and then we uh, get to send it to, to you because uh, nobody um, uh, is able to take it on the plane. You know, the bats are, are restricted uh, from being uh, taken uh, 
taken home on the plane. That's one of those restricted items. But you can see Jason is holding it up now. And uh, right. you will eventually be sent a, a, a slugger bat with your name on it. And uh, uh, you can use it. Uh, uh, you, you know, we don't we don't recommend beating your children or wife <laughs> wife with it. <laughs> well, thank you very much. It was really a great fun to uh, uh, to be a part of this virtual. I wish I was there with you in person, but uh, I will. Uh, I, I'm looking forward to receiving my bat, and I will use it appropriately. Very good. Yeah, thank you. Thank anybody you. Anybody else Kirsten. have any comments that anybody needs to make? Otherwise, we will uh, we will sign off. Yeah, just want to say thank you, Dr. Cowan, for another outstanding invitation, and Dr. Kirshner, another great, absolutely outstanding dermatology talk this morning. And uh, thank you for helping us power for helping us power through <laughs> some of the some of the glitches this morning. But it was outstanding. And um, and uh, Dr. Kruger has said that that uh, she put in the comment that. Fantastic lecture, and uh, her uh, emergency medicine husband uh, was most interested as well. So, uh, and others are just uh, you know giving some uh, kudos as well in the chat. You can probably, if, if you look at the chat, Rob, you'll be able to see uh, some of what happens in this uh, grand rounds. Is that uh, people are asked to uh, sign in. So the first uh, several hundred uh, chats, there were about a hundred people on uh, on this. Uh, 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 grand rounds today, uh, and uh, and you'll see that everybody sort of signs in and tells tells who you are. Uh, the CME office actually records it when you put in your number, but otherwise, uh, I don't know why, but the tradition is for them, everybody to sign in the chat. So there's lots of chats saying here I am, and who I am, and then uh, then we have a few that are questions, and then uh, Jason usually puts in the uh, link for evaluations, uh, uh, and um, here you go. So, great. Well, thank you very much. I'm I'm, I'm thrilled uh, uh, that people enjoyed it and uh, look forward to seeing people in person in the not too distant future. Good deal. All, All right. right. Take and, uh, care. Go.